Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, May 2021 meeting of the Naperville Astronomical Association here in uh, from Northern Illinois. I uh, would like to thank you all for showing up uh, tonight virtually, or if you're watching this program as a recorded presentation in the future, uh, thanks for looking us up and uh, finding our online resources here at YouTube. Uh, briefly, before we get into tonight's program, I'd like to uh, just review the, the upcoming events calendar. And uh, the first thing to note is for this month, our uh, May Astronomy Fundamentals program. The subject is uh, concerning how many amateur astronomers who live in urban and suburban areas like we have here around the Naperville area uh, like to go out to Dark place, darker places to, uh, to stargaze where we can see more stars under a less light polluted sky. And so the presentation is going to be about preparing and uh, behaving as it were <laughs> at, uh, at dark site observing. Uh, some of it is how to get ready for it and uh, be set to get the most out of an evening in the dark. And some of it will cover uh, how to be a good neighbor to uh, other people who are out observing in the dark. So that's uh, Tuesday the 18th, that's two weeks from tonight. And uh, here in our streaming realm on Facebook or on our club website. The uh, next major thing on the calendar is for uh, next month's meeting program and for our June meeting, which will be on uh, Tuesday, June the 1st. Again, here in our streaming venues. Uh, the presentation is going to be um, on a complicated uh, subject of uh, dark matter and uh, the theories related to it, but trying to present it from a uh, very basic view from the uh, high school level of uh, science. So uh, not a lot of uh, <laughs> calculus and uh, magnetohydrodynamics and things like that. So. Uh, uh, our presenter that night is a uh, PhD mathematician, but he's going to, again, keep it more science level. So that's something to look forward to in June. Otherwise, on our uh, calendar, on our club website, we've got um, anything that's scheduled uh, as far as public outreach. So you'll find that on our website. And uh, as a uh, note that I usually give, if we do any pop-up events that are observing related, usually those come out with very little notice. So we put uh, a note maybe a day ahead of time, sometimes even the same day uh, on our Facebook page and our, our for our members on our club message board. So that's a place to keep watching. And as I already mentioned, we have our uh, backlog of really more than a year's worth now of our regular meeting programs, our astronomy fundamentals programs, and uh, some other live stream events that we've done available on our YouTube channel. So that's something to look up also. So um, tonight, as per usual, if you are watching us live, we uh, welcome questions for our presenter. And if you have any and you're on Facebook, if you simply put them in the comments column, we are following that and we will pass those along to the speaker. If you uh, prefer to use email or you're watching from the club website, you can send us an email and Again, we will follow that inbox and pass along things that come in during the presentation to the speaker. So uh, for tonight, we have um, a, there we go, I want to make sure it comes up on the screen. We have a guest speaker who is, uh, I believe, if I get this right, an associate professor at uh, University of Chicago and also is affiliated with the uh, Fermi Institute there. And uh, Dr. Caparelli is going to speak to us about a, a really interesting subject that I don't think we've had a presentation on in quite some time um, on cosmic rays and um, what they are and how long it's taken scientists to figure out where they come from. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the airwaves over to Dr. Caparelli. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation uh, to speak uh, at this meeting. And uh, um, I'm really uh, eager to, to tell you something about uh, uh, cosmic rays. And uh, let me start by sharing my, my screen. 
such that you see what I see. And uh, um, the title um, says it all in the sense that uh, this is really one of the uh, long lasting issues in, in astrophysics, but probably in physics uh, uh, in general. So let me start um, a little bit by uh, telling you what was the very early history. Hey, of real quick, we have a little sure. box uh, that's blocking part of the screen. It says build order. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you might want to move. Yes, I don't see it. It's okay. not on my, on my screen. Sorry. All right, thank you. Um, so the very early history of uh, uh, cosmic rays, it's actually at, at the end of the 19th century. And people had these uh, devices, uh, they were called, they're still used today, they're gold leaf electroscopes. So you, it's very simple. You have a sort of a vacuum with two uh, gold leaves here. You charge a stick by rubbing it. You know, at the time it was like an ember stick. So you have an excess of positive charges. That means that uh, these, um, this region and its metal plate is charged with the negative charge and that this excess of positive charges in the leaves makes them uh, separate. Uh, you, you might expect that these uh, should stay there uh, almost forever. In reality, people discovered that uh, this is a modern one, for instance, you can, that you can buy uh, online for $20. And uh, the question is, why do they uh, discharge instead. So what is the, why these leaves tend to go back together? And uh, those were the times where people were discovering uh, new physics, uh, new ionizing radiation. Röntgen had just discovered the X-rays and radioactivity uh, was also discovered by works by Becquerel and Curies and so on. So uh, the idea was that probably what is causing the discharge of electroscopes is natural radioactivity. So the, in the Earth's crust, uh, there are um, radioactive elements and they are emitting continuously radiation, X-rays and even high uh, charged particles. So maybe this is the, uh, this is the case. Then in 1911, um, the plot thickens because uh, Domenico Pacini uh, was conducting an experiment uh, uh, in a lake near Rome and found that uh, this ionization, so this discharge, was affecting also, even to a lesser extent, underwater. Which means that all of these X-rays and this radioactivity that people were talking about should be screened by the water itself. So um, what is the cause of this uh, uh, ionizing radiation? This is the discovery of cosmic rays, which uh, traditionally dates 1912, when Victor Hess, um, um, an Austrian um, physicist, I would say, uh, went and made some experiments by taking uh, elect electroscopes on a balloon for high altitude flights. And uh, what he saw is that initially, when you go away from, from the ground, the amount, the strength of this ionization goes down as you would expect because you're going away from the radioactive elements in the, in, in the Earth's uh, crust. But then when you go a few kilometers up in the air, this uh, uh, ionization radiation goes up by a lot. This means that there must be some radiation that comes from outside of the atmosphere, something extraterrestrial. And that's where uh, when they uh, realized that, that these must come from the cosmos, and so they call them cosmic rays. Um, a few years later, uh, these, uh, they uh, uh, strive for measuring cosmic ray fluxes at a high altitude, uh, led Auguste Picard uh, to be the first man to reach the stratosphere. So he built a, a pressurized gondola like this that was attached to a hydrogen balloon and went up to uh, almost 16 kilometers so in, in, in the stratosphere, just to measure cosmic rays. Here it is with uh, his uh, assistant and see that they were wearing these rudimental helmets, basically a, a basket with, with a pillow inside. So those were the times, all of these to measure cosmic rays. And uh, a little bit of fun facts, uh, you might have, so Picard is a name that, that you may know from Star Trek, for instance, in fact, uh, the captain of the Enterprise is named after him and his brother, who's also, who's also uh, a balloonist uh, and, uh, uh, and, flight, and 
uh, so took part in some of these flights with him. Uh, another fun fact is that then the same um, um, vessel, this gondola, was also uh, taken to explore the sea depths. And in fact, that was called the Batis Cave. And uh, he went to uh, Picard with uh, his son, Jacques, went uh, uh, down up to uh, three kilometers uh, above the sea, uh, below the sea level in 1954. And then, uh, sorry, uh, his uh, uh, Jacques Picard was uh, then the first to reach the Mariana Trench, so the, the, the deepest point uh, in, in the ocean. So it was uh, the Picard's family is rich in, in explorers, uh, and they they dived uh, to the, the the darkest depths and uh, reached the stratosphere. And it was also um, a women thing, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, the wife of Jean Picard, Jeanette Picard, who was a chemist herself, uh, was uh, technically the first woman in space because she reached the the, the stratosphere too uh, with this uh, device. Another fun fact is that the original um, um, gondola by Picard is actually now at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. And it has been there since 1935. And this is the actual instrument that uh, Picard used to set the record, uh, the 10 then record of uh, altitude at about um, 20 kilometers high. So um, this is a little bit of the pioneering uh, era of cosmic ray exploration. But in the same years, in the 30s, people were really wondering, what are cosmic rays? And people realize, so this is an extract from Modern Mechanics 1932, that they may be the only thing immortal in the universe because stars are going to uh, fade away um, and uh, uh, you know, galaxies may... Um, uh, merge and evolve, uh, uh, eventually only cosmic rays um, remain. And people, there were like three Nobel laureates, uh, Jeans, Millikan, and Compton, who were discussing different um, uh, scenarios for the origin of cosmic rays. So Jeans suggested that were produced uh, in the star interior, so that in the uh, innermost regions of stars, like in our sun, where the temperature is so high that you can generate very high energy particles. Millikan suggested that uh, cosmic rays were actually the birth cry of the atoms that are, must be formed um, in, the, uh, in the universe. So when, at the time, uh, nucleosynthesis wasn't really understood yet. So uh, uh, Millikan assumed that uh, to make a helium nucleus, you have to fuse the four protons together. And in the process, you release energy that seems to be um, energetic enough to uh, explain cosmic rays. That was uh, his idea. Uh, Arthur Compton, instead of the University of Chicago, um, had a more mundane, if you want, explanation. It's, these are just charged particles like the ele electrons or protons that are somehow accelerated to very large energies that allow them to travel across the universe. But in 1932, this wasn't uh, um, uh, yet clear. Um, meanwhile, in, uh, in somewhere in Europe, technically in Florence, uh, there was a Bruno Rossi who uh, was a, a, at the time he was in Florence with other um, very famous uh, Italian physicists of the time like Enrico Fermi and uh, Beppo Chiellini. And when he first hears of cosmic rays, he says, came like a flash of light re revealing the existence of an unsuspected world full of mysteries, which no one had yet begun to explore. It soon became my overwhelming ambition to participate in the exploration. So he did. So he invented um, a device that's called a coincidence circuit, which basically allows to take uh, um, uh, correlations and of several uh, Gagner-Müller counters. So you you have uh, uh, these counters that uh, tell you when a cosmic ray, when ionizing radiation is going through. But since uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, cosmic rays can trigger more than one counter, you need to know, you need to synchronize them, the signal from all of these different counters uh, to understand what was the ultimate thing that struck your detector. And this was crucial as it will come, uh, become clear in a second. But in 1933, he uses this 
uh, cosmic ray telescope, which is basically these two uh, uh, Geiger counters that have a, the, the a direction where it's where it's easier to measure cosmic ray fluxes. So they give you a sort of an idea of where cosmic rays are coming from. He pointed uh, to the west and to the east and uh, discovered that uh, there are more cosmic rays coming from the west than from the east. Why is that? It's because they must be charged particles that feel the Earth's magnetic field. So if you think about how the magnetic field of the Earth is, is you know, you have field lines that connect the North Pole and the South Pole, particles in the magnetic field have to gyrate in one given sign, depending on, on their charge. So you have, on one side, you are screened from the Earth itself. On the other side, you can reach you can achieve, you can receive, sorry, cosmic rays from, from the universe. And so the fact that uh, there is an asymmetry between East and West means that cosmic rays are charged. And the fact that uh, uh, they, you have more from the West means that uh, they have to be positive. This was puzzling because one would expect that it's easier to accelerate electrons that are light rather than protons, but yet that was a piece of information. And with this uh, coincidence uh, circuit, he was able to see that sometimes uh, uh, the recording equipment was struck by extensive showers of particles. So you can trigger counters that were several meters apart. And that will become crucial in uh, one second, as I'll tell you, uh, in order to study high energy cosmic rays. Um, then Another, I don't have time to, to, to tell everything that, that Bruno Rossi did, but he was the first one to measure uh, the lifetime and uh, the, the decay time of the muon, and that was measured in cosmic rays. That was the first proof of, the, of Einstein's theory of special relativity, and then that uh, time and space are not absolute, but they uh, depend on, on the reference frame, in particular the lifetime of the muon is much longer in our reference frame than the, in the muon itself. So, and then uh, he was also a pioneer of uh, space, of ascending uh, uh, probes uh, um, in, in space and to gamma ray astron, uh, X-ray astronomy, sorry. If you're interested, I strongly suggest that his autobiography, which is Moments in the Life of a Scientist, uh, it's a it's a very inspiring book, uh, book that tells um, a lot of interesting stories for, of the first years of the discovery of cosmic rays and related. Um, this was uh, in the early 30s, but then a lot of uh, interesting particle physics also happened in the um, in, in cosmic rays. And in uh, Carl Anderson discovered that the positron in the cosmic rays. So these. Uh, a sibling of the electrons, just if it's an antimatter and it has positive charge, was first discovered in cosmic rays. And uh, uh, I mentioned uh, briefly how uh, these extensive showers were, um, were re reported already by, by Bruno Rossi. Um, the muon was discovered a few years later, another important uh, particle that's sort of the heavier uh, sibling of the electron, if you want. And uh, uh, by, an, by the end of the 30s, uh, Bruno Rossi's technique was uh, used uh, to show that uh, cosmic ray showers can have very large energies. Don't worry too much about uh, this uh, um, these, uh, actual number. I'll tell you a bit more uh, in, in, in a few slides, uh, the scale of energies that are involved in the cosmic rays. Uh, by, the, by the 60s, people already realized that cosmic rays can achieve so-called ultra high energies at the energies of 10 to the nine times the rest mass of a proton. What does this mean? Well, let that aside for one second, but let me just flash that uh, uh, Philip Morrison, who was an important scientist himself, uh, worked on the Manhattan Project and he was also um, very active uh, in outreach, uh, reported Einstein's quote, uh, 1954, who says that uh, there were two there were two easily observable phenomena that showed a deep fundamental lack in our knowledge of the physical world. These, he said, were the cosmic rays and the terrestrial magnetic field. So, cosmic rays have been discovered 40 years before, and yet people didn't have. Uh, uh, they understood they were charged particles, but still, where did they come from? Uh, 
was a, was still a mystery. So this is how the spectrum of cosmic rays that 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 we measure uh, now looks like. So it's uh, let me guide you through. This is the number of particles that it, that it strikes the Earth per square meter of per second per unit energy. And this is the energy in uh, units of electron volts. This is the typical scale that is used in uh, um, nuclear physics, but also in, in astrophysics, in high energy astrophysics. Uh, this is logarithmic space, just to tell you that there are, every step is a factor of 10. So these particles have two, 10 to the nine electron volts, and these particles have 10 to the 21. So there is a factor of 10, there are 12 orders of magnitude in energy difference. And uh, yet the flux of cosmic rays is pretty regular. It's, a, it's called a power law in energy. And it has two main features. There is a, they, they are traditionally named after a sort of a leg. So there is the knee and then the ankle. So a slightly steeper region, a steeper region and a flattening at the end. What is interesting here to see is that at uh, these energies, like 10, um, 10 to the 10 uh, electron volts, you receive, uh, the Earth receives one particle per square meter per second. So basically the surface of a human uh, body is, uh, uh, would receive one cosmic ray per second. But when you go at energies of 10 to the 15 electron volts, uh, then you have one particle per square meter per year. And at 10 to the 18, this become, the flux becomes so low that it's one particle per kilometer square per year. So uh, there, are, there have been uh, countless experiments uh, to measure cosmic ray fluxes over this broad range of energies. And I won't go into, into the details of this, but this is something that has been um, uh, studied extensively. And uh, it's one of the most remarkable regular features, uh, I would say, in physics, that the fact that the distribution is not uh, is so ordered requires uh, a simple explanation. There must be a reason why cosmic rays show this behavior. This cannot be by chance. So where they come from has to explain also why they are so regular. So I wanted to spend like one slide on uh, to give you an idea of the how many orders of magnitude are involved, how many factors of 10 are involved in these uh, in cosmic ray physics. So these are the typical prefixes that you might have been, um, you might be familiar with, uh, uh, especially if you think in terms of uh, uh, like hard drives that so you have uh, uh, gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, and that's not something that you have in your laptop, but uh, that gives you an idea, right? And you have a symbol that explains this power of 10. Uh, you know, they, they come from the, these names, like Terra comes from uh, Tetra, which means uh, four in Greek, and that means thousand to the fourth power. That's how you get 10 to the 12. And uh, Peta comes from Penta, which is 10, five in Greek, again, Hex and Hepta, six and seven, same way. Just to give you an idea that these names are, are not constructed by, I mean, the, 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 there is a reasoning behind them. But just to give you an idea, this is a tera, by, a, a tera electron volt. It's the energy achievable in modern laboratories, like the Fermilab, this is or at LHC, this is the uh, maximum energy that you can, uh, that you can achieve. Um, a typical interstellar particle, so a typical particle in the interstellar medium has uh, an energy, which is uh, 10 to the minus nine in, the, in these units, that would be the rest mass of, of, the, um, of one electron, so of, of one proton, I'm sorry. And uh, um, this is, these are the seed particles. So these are the particles that uh, eventually need to be accelerated. Most of the cosmic, the cos this is normalized to the energy of the most common cosmic rays, which is of order of a giga electron volt. So that would be a GeV. Um, and uh, the idea is that the highest energy cosmic rays are up here at the 10 to the 20. So this is, this is remarkable because this depends, uh, uh, you need to understand how you can make a particle gain such a, uh, factors of 10 in energy. And this is non-trivial. 
but let me spend one word about how cosmic rays are actually measured today. So at low energy cosmic rays, so below uh, 10 to the 10 electron volts, the flux is very large and uh, um, the, they have been observed regularly since uh, the 40s uh, when through a device that's called a neutron monitor, it just measures the flux of neutrons that are produced as secondary particles in the atmosphere, but it's a good proxy for the flux of cosmic rays overall. What is interesting is that the flux of cosmic rays at these energies anti-correlates with the sun activity. So the more sunspots you have on the sun, the more the sun is active, the stronger is the solar wind, the fewer particles, the fewer cosmic rays of these energies you get. And that's because these particles are basically blown away or they are kept out of the solar system by the solar wind. Uh, and that is uh, occasionally some of these particles can be generated by the sun itself and through solar flares, uh, uh, coronal mass ejections and phenomena of this kind. But this is basically, so these low energy cosmic rays are in the real of space physics and sun uh, driven thing. Uh, when you go at higher energies, up to 10 to the 15 electron volts, these cosmic rays are those that really come from the galaxy. And I'll justify this statement in a second, but uh, th this is where most of the particles are. So you have one particle per square meter per second of, in, at these energies. How do you measure them? Well, actually you can, uh, you can measure them from the ground or you can build, you can attach your detector uh, to a balloon or build a satellite with a detector in it such that you can go above the atmosphere and uh, uh, measure the fluxes of cosmic rays uh, in a more pristine way because the atmosphere absorbs these cosmic rays. And uh, there is also an experiment that's called AMS, which is attached to the International Space Station. So this is a picture of it. Uh, that's a great place where to put a big um, magnetometer in space where you can measure a large flux of cosmic rays without them being bothered by the atmosphere itself. When you go to larger energies instead, uh, it becomes uh, harder because these particles are actually absorbed by the atmosphere better. Um, at an, an altitude of about uh, 30, depending on the energy, but the 20, 30, 40 kilometers, these cosmic rays uh, hit a nitrogen nucleus and break down into pieces that you have, uh, without going into details, so you, you generate these muons, you generate photons, uh, protons, uh, neutrons, uh, you have uh, uh, nuclei that are produced, uh, you also have neutrinos, but the idea is that you produce these showers that, ex that are extended over kilometers. So that's why Bruno Rossi uh, was uh, seeing that coincidence that in the, in the signals from detectors that were several meters apart. Actually, you can see these between detectors that, that are tens of kilometers apart. They, are, they trigger simultaneously because they are produced by the same very energetic particle that hit the atmosphere from um, uh, coming from the outer space. And uh, these are a few experiments uh, that uh, these measure particles in the so-called knee region. See that you have these detectors that uh, this is this was in Germany. And now this experiment has, has been the commission that uh, has taken data for several years. And uh, see they are reasonably spaced apart. There is one that is um, active right now in in, in, uh, in China, and it's called Argo YBJ. Uh, it's here you see Yaxa roaming around. And, and then when you go to even higher energies, you have something like this, which is probably the most, uh, uh, one of the two uh, most important observatories for a high, the, high, the ultra high energy particles, which is the Pierre Auger Observatory. And you, can you see that if you cannot, it's because actually each, these, uh, these, uh, this is, the, is in Argentina, and uh, it's in the plains in the Pampa. And you see every, every now and then there is uh, a small tank that uh, resonate with, uh, with these particles that are uh, with these showers. But you, you wanted to measure particles that are so energetic that actually uh, they spend an area that is about uh, 3000 kilometers square. 
So this is a very extended experiment. There is a one that is similar in um, in Utah to, in, to be in the northern atmosphere, in the northern hemisphere, and to cover the whole uh, full sky this way. But uh, this doesn't look like a telescope, but it is. It is a telescope for cosmic rays, and it's actually measuring the highest energy particles in the universe. By the way, these particles are the first particle at a very high energy that was uh, uh, detected. Uh, these are uh, very high, um, at the highest energy detect particle detected in the 90s was detected in uh, Utah, and uh, it was dubbed the oh my god particle because people didn't believe that it was possible to achieve such energies. But now these particles are routinely observed. They are rare, remember, but um, they one particle per um, kilometer square per year. But if you have a detector that is 3,000 kilometers square, you still get uh, plenty of them. This particle, this OMG particle, would travel. It's so relativistic. It's, it's so um, fast. It's so energetic. It travels at a speed which is 99.99% of the speed of light. Just to give you an idea, if you have a race between this particle and a photon, which by definition travels at the speed of light, which is the highest speed that you can achieve, uh, across the whole universe, the photon wins, of course, it's, nothing can be faster, but it only, wins, it only wins by a few miles. So uh, in other words, if you, if you make a, a race between these two particles, it takes uh, something like uh, 25,000 years for the photon to achieve to a lead of one centimeter over such a particle. So these are really particles so that are traveling basically at the speed of light. And uh, but they are massive. So they are like protons. So you, you are concentrating a lot of energy in a subatomic particle. And so that's the, the energy of such a particle. Is, if you don't want to think in electron volts, you can think in joules, for instance, this is 51 joule. So what is that? Well, it's the kinetic energy of a person that is walking, or if you want, of a baseball that is thrown by a professional pitcher. So you can, you can understand that you get hurt if you get uh, um, uh, hit by, uh, by such a baseball. And uh, uh, that now imagine to, con to concentrate all of this energy into subatomic particles, and that's pretty remarkable. How do you do that? That's a big mystery. Uh, this is probably the highest energy. This um, limit uh, is not uh, due to our ability to detect them, likely, but it's because if you make higher energy particles, they start interacting with the cosmic microwave background and they break down into pieces, basically. So this was actually one of the first implications. So in 1966, when the cosmic microwave background was, uh, uh, was found serendipitously, uh, scientists uh, uh, Greisen in the US and Satsepin and Kuzmin in the um, Soviet Union immediately realized that uh, this uh, cosmic background radiation was a deal breaker for a, a cosmic race that would have limited the maximum energy that could be achieved. And it's actually uh, measure. So now that we know that the flux of cosmic rays is cut off at this energy because of this interaction with the CMB. Uh, but we are physicists, we wanted to understand what are the sources of these particles, not just to measure them. We want to understand how do you accelerate particles, uh, how nature accelerates particles. Well, what you can say, at least, uh, you say, okay, I don't know how particles are actually accelerated. But let the, there is a criterion, which is called a Hillis criterion, which is rather simple. So I want to, let's not to look at the, at the plot for, for one second, just to consider in words reasonably, the source has to be large enough for the cosmic ray to be confined into the source. And these are charged particles, so they gyrate around magnetic fields. So in order to accelerate particles up to a given energy, you need either a large system or a system with a lot of magnetic field. Better if you have both. So basically, if you just plot the, in the typical size of a source, this one, and typical magnetic field that you have in a source, you have some lines that tell you what kind of objects 
uh, either laboratories or astrophysical objects can accelerate particles up to that energy. So that already helps you rule out some of potential sources as accelerators of cosmic rays. In particular, if you take the typical size of a galaxy and the typical magnetic field in a galaxy, you see that galactic cosmic rays cannot be accelerated uh, beyond the 10 to the 17 electron volts. So the idea is that this knee, this steepening that you see in the spectrum is where you have a transition between particles that are accelerated in our galaxy and particles that are accelerated outside of our galaxy. They must come from somewhere else. These ultra high energy cosmic rays are accelerated through a different process. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, how these particles in these two regimes can be accelerated. And uh, the idea is that uh, this goes back to the so-called supernova remnant uh, paradigm. And uh, what are supernova remnants? You probably have heard of, of supernovae, like these are massive stars that end their, their life uh, in a boom. So they explode, they shed the outer layers, they eject them into, the, um, into space, in, into the interstellar medium at supersonic speed. And uh, um, this wasn't always known. Uh, the idea of a supernova comes uh, from uh, a paper by Baden and Zwick in 1934. It's actually two, two very short papers, like three pages each. And uh, in these two papers, they put forward three pillars of high energy astrophysics and probably of physics in general. The first is that they uh, coined the term supernova, uh, labeling these stars that explode and completely disrupting. So that's opposed to novi, that are stars that undergo one eruption, but the, the eruption doesn't disrupt the star completely. And uh, then this uh, um, hypothesized that uh, these supernovae should leave be behind a relic in the shape of a star made of neutrons. And neutron stars and pulsars are actually observed. Uh, and, uh, but that was the first time that were um, suggested. And uh, also they said, well, since we have these explosions, maybe we can use this, the energy in this explosion to accelerate cosmic rays. So three main ideas put forward in four pages. Uh, of, a, of a publication. And they calculated that if you can channel 10% of the supernova energy into cosmic rays, you can power the flux of cosmic rays seen in our galaxy. This is a picture of a, a nearby galaxy that looks pretty much like ours, uh, where a supernova, a star went supernova. And you see that uh, the luminosity of a supernova is uh, actually comparable to the luminosity of uh, the whole uh, host galaxy for for a few months it can uh, it can really be comparable to the light produced by all the other 10 to the 11 stars that you have and the idea is that these stars that explode are connected to uh, supernova uh, sorry to the origin of cosmic rays these are some pictures of uh, these uh, uh, supernovae uh, these supernova remnants uh, this is uh, Tycho, Tano 6, uh, Cassiopeia A, and that's a, this has a phone number that it, it doesn't, um, it's not very important, but uh, these are beautiful objects that you cannot see with your, with your telescopes because these are mostly, these are taken in the x-rays uh, because the gas is so hot that it is emitting uh, x-rays. The temperature is about 10 to the uh, 7, 10 to the 8 uh, degrees Kelvin. And uh, uh, they are beautiful and uh, they have a, a, a shock. So they have a blast wave that, uh, that, that, uh, that is generated when these expand into the, um, into the interstellar medium. And I'll get to that in a second. The idea is how do we cosmic rays, uh, how do cosmic rays are accelerating supernova remnants? Well, this is related to the idea that Enrico Fermi had uh, here in Chicago in 1948. This is, is, is note, theory of cosmic rays. There are basically three equations that uh, we could, I could walk you uh, through. Um, general, relativistic uh, generalization and so on. The idea, 
led to one of the most influential papers uh, in, in astrophysics. Uh, and the idea that cosmic rays can be accelerated by the so-called Fermi process. So what, what is this? What, what is it? Well, the idea is that uh, Fermi acceleration is pretty much like a, a ping pong match. The idea is that when you have a, a, a part, you have a particle that is moving and it gets hit by a head-on collision, the particle comes back with more energy than it had before because it comes back with a, a little bit of the energy of the of the mirror too. And uh, on the other hand, when the, if, you, if a particle experiences a tail-on collision uh, or you know it is overtaken, the particle loses a little bit of energy. But if you are traveling in a sea of mirrors that move in any possible direction, it's easier to see, to experience head-on collisions. Because like when you, if you drive on the highway, you have, you see more cars coming in front of you than uh, cars overtaking you. Or if you bike in the rain, you get more wet in the front than in the back. That's the same thing. So you, the probability of having head-on collisions is larger than probability of having tail-on collisions. And so uh, this is really like a, um, like a, um, a, a, tennis, a ping pong uh, match when you try to smash uh, and uh, if there weren't a friction of the air, the particle would keep on accelerating over and over again. And uh, uh, I don't have time to play all of these, uh, um, all of these uh, uh, interesting uh, ping pong matches. But the idea is that if you apply this to a supernova remnant uh, and uh, the uh, theory of uh, how a strong explosion produces shocks uh, was something that uh, was put forward by Sedov in the 50s. And this was, uh, of the application, as you can see from the from the cover of the book, wasn't to astrophysics, but the explosion of a nuclear bomb and the explosion of a supernova are, uh, have some similarities. Uh, the idea is that if you can, in the late 70s, people realized that if you apply this uh, acceleration process, this Fermi acceleration at a shock, when the particle is as it is squeeze the between two converging flows. So if you are ahead of the shock, it's called upstream, you see the, the, the shock coming towards you. So you experience a head-on collision, you gain energy. But then if the particle goes downstream, so behind the shock, and when if it, if it manages to come back upstream, it will see the uh, upstream flow coming towards it. So every time the particle crosses the shock, uh, it gains energy. This process is called diffusive shock acceleration because a particle diffuses across the shock and gets accelerated. Why is this thing so interesting? It's because, well, it's general and it produces these regular spectra that are observed in cosmic rays, this called power law spectra. So we have not just an energetic argument the one given by Bad and Zwicky, but we also have Fermi acceleration, which is a model for producing um, this uh, acceleration. And as you see, it's crucial that particles can be scattered back and forth. And what is scattering particles back and forth? Magnetic fields. So magnetic fields are effectively the uh, ping pong players that bounce particles back and forth across the shock. And uh, what is really interesting is that uh, these uh, magnetic fields uh, in supernova remnants, uh, when you see them in the X-rays, for instance, with the Chandra telescope, you can infer, I spare you the details, but uh, you, can, you can see that, uh, that there are these thin rings all around. And by looking at the thickness of these rings, you can actually put a lower limit on the magnetic field strength in these regions. And you find out that this, the magnetic field in supernova remnants is a factor of 100 larger than the typical feed in the galaxy. So it's natural to see that, okay, particles are accelerated because here the magnetic fields are large, so they can diffuse back and forth across the shock. And uh, this seems really the end of the story because, so we have a mechanism that produces this regular spectra of accelerated particles. We have a process that produces a lot of, the, um, we have uh, uh, explosions that produce a lot of energy. 
And uh, we see that uh, they correlate with magnetic field amplification. So they are, they, there are strong ping pong players uh, on both sides of these shocks. Are we happy? So is this enough to, to say that this is a theory that we understand how particles are accelerated? Not really, because this process doesn't tell you that acceleration is efficient. You remember, we have to channel at least 10% of the supernova energy into these cosmic rays. This is non-trivial. This might not be true. Even if the, the process seemed to work, we need to test it. And so is there also any observational counterpart? Uh, can we see as some signature of acceleration of cosmic rays in these supernova remnants? And yet, what is the maximum energy that can be achieved? in these environments? Are we able to explain all the uh, cosmic rays that we see with this process? And this is where my, my personal research uh, um, kicks in. So the idea is that uh, shocks are, uh, are everywhere. They can be, um, you have a shock, a shocks around the earth uh, in the, uh, the shock that the earth's bow shock that's formed by the interaction of the earth's magnetic field with the solar wind. You have interplanetary shocks triggered by solar flares. You have uh, stellar wind termination shocks. You have novae, supernova remnants. You have uh, these giant lobes that are produced by uh, active galactic nuclei. These are, this is a galaxy. So these are lobes that are on scales that are 10 times larger than, than a galaxy. And there are relativistic counterparts like in the, the Crab Nebula, uh, there are gamma ray bursts, uh, uh, jets launched by active galactic nuclei, which are even longer. Um, so they're not just these lobes, but they are more elongated structure. They're basically cosmological. And, and then there are shocks in clusters of galaxies. These clusters, uh, th these shocks are as large as a cluster of galaxies, which are the largest gravitationally bound structures in the universe. And right now we are also starting to produce these shocks to be astrophysical in these astrophysical conditions in laboratory by using the most powerful lasers that we have. So these shocks that accelerate particles, are, are, all of these pictures that I showed you have something to do with some accelerated particles. Some of the light that we see from these objects tells us that the particles are accelerated there. This is non-thermal activity. How do we understand that uh, how particles are produced? Well, what I do uh, is to use the so-called, uh, I do computer simulations uh, that exploits this uh, particle in cell approach. It's very simple. So you have a grid uh, where you have a, man a magnetic and electric field. You put particles on top. You have, let's say, big red protons and small blue electrons in this picture. And, uh, uh, you know the, how particles move, they, uh, they uh, experience the Lorentz force. So if you know the electric fields, you know how to move these particles around. And you know that Maxwell equations tell you for a given current and a charge distribution, uh, how the mag and man magnetic and electric fields evolve. So if you know and trust Lorentz equation, uh, Lorentz force and Maxwell equations, you can evolve uh, these astrophysical plasmas without any further assumption. This is brute force though, because the, in order to move, move billions of particles, trillions of particles, you have to use the most, power, super, the most powerful supercomputers in the world. This is uh, the, the computer that I used, uh, a supercomputer at the University of uh, Texas, Austin, that I'll be using right now. But in a few years, a few months, hopefully, um, uh, Myra at Fermilab will be online, and this is going to be one of the fastest supercomputers in the world. So modeling um, astrophysical plasmas and particular shocks with this principle, with this, from first principles with this particle and cell approach, should be able to tell us how particles are accelerated. And in fact, it does. So without going into much details, uh, let me show you uh, a movie of, uh, of one of these simulations. So the way in which you have, how you, you produce a shock by sending a flow against the wall. So the wall uh, produces a reflected flow that comes back and uh, moves to the right and will move to the right in, in, this, in these movies. 
On the top panel, I show the density plus the trajectory of some particles that you can follow. And then in the bottom panel, I show what is the out of plane component of the magnetic field, which in the beginning is basically zero because the field is aligned, is along this uh, x axis. And uh, this is how it looks like. So a shock is something that uh, produces um, a density increase and it heats the plasma up. So you basically convert kinetic energy into heat. And the, you see that particles come in, these are, they have a little tail that's basically their trajectory. And every time they cross the shock, they bounce back and uh, they, uh, their tail becomes longer. It is also color coded. And these particles gain energy. So this is the firm acceleration that I mentioned before. It's a head-on collision. So it's like playing ping pong between the two sides of the shock. And if you pay attention in the bottom panel, you see that the, the magnetic field initially was zero. And now there is this development of magnetic fields. There are magnetic fields even ahead of the shock that wasn't there before. Why is that? It's because these, because the reflected particles, the particles that are scattered back upstream, uh, generate a current. And these current, uh, currents generate magnetic fields. So let me show you this in another in another movie. This is density, and these are three components: a total component, total magnetic field, and other components. But it's not dramatically important. But uh, the point here is that you you see how uh, this this shock. Now there are no particle trajectories and uh, trajectory anymore. But you see that there are all of these magnetic structures, these turbulence that is produced by particles that are scattered back. So the takeaway message here is that the magnetic fields and supernova remnants are large because they are generated by the currents of the cosmic rays that are being accelerated. It's a very beautiful uh, nonlinear process in which you, the more particles you accelerate, the more currents you have, the more magnetic field you have, the faster your acceleration is. It's a runaway process in which particles and fields help each other. And that's how you get to very large energies. Uh, this is another simulation. It's, you can do 3D and uh, I'll probably skip this because uh, I want to get to the, to the to, uh, I'm almost at the end of, of, my, of my talk. I promised that I, I would have shown you uh, also an observational counterpart uh, of this. And uh, this is, uh, was found uh, in, uh, um, in uh, 20, 2012. So basically 100 years after the discovery of the cosmic rays uh, by looking at the Tycho supernova, rem supernova remnant. So this is called Tycho because that was uh, the first, uh, um, uh, so Tycho, the, the, the Danish astronomer, spotted a new star in the sky and called it uh, the Nova Stella, so the new star. And these people later realized that this was a new star. That was a star that went supernova. That was only 400 years later that people understood what supernovae were. So, and uh, uh, he called it nova, and then people realized that there were that was a supernova. So this, to some extent, is uh, the prototypical supernova remnant. And when you look at the, its emission from the radio to X-rays to gamma rays, and that's where it's important, uh, um, and you model the gamma ray emissions of the highest energy photons that are produced in these objects, you realize that uh, these uh, gamma rays are produced uh, by very energetic protons. So basically by cosmic ray protons. That's why I say that this is the smoking gun. Uh, for cosmic ray acceleration, because these photons can only come, uh, these gamma rays can only come by the interaction of accelerated cosmic rays with an interstellar medium that is in the source itself. And in order to power the observed gamma ray emission, you need an efficiency of 10%, which is exactly the one that you would expect. And uh, you see that particles are accelerated up to the knee. So a pet electron volt, uh, which is the knee of the cosmic ray spectrum. And if you remember, that is where you expect a transition between galactic and extragalactic cosmic rays. So when you put all of this together, you see that the diffusive shock acceleration at supernova in supernova remnants, it's really the process that is responsible for the acceleration of the galactic cosmic rays. 
And uh, uh, this is a, a story, is a century long story that has a, a lot of uh, observational and uh, uh, theoretical contribution that has been possible on, that has been made possible by uh, discoveries in, uh, um, um, in supercomputers uh, and techniques for developed for supercomputers and by uh, 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 the last generation of high energy telescopes. In this respect, uh, you know, Enrico Fermi was uh, uh, nicknamed the Pope of physics because uh, as he, uh, as the Pope is supposed to always to be infallible, to be never wrong, when he speaks about uh, uh, church matters, uh, Fermi was supposed not to be uh, to be always right, to be infallible when he was speaking physics, and uh, so. Uh, he, he was a, a good friend and colleague, of, of course, of Chandra Sekhar at the, the University of Chicago. And uh, um, when in 1953, uh, Fermi was, uh, uh, was sick, he had cancer, probably for uh, having handled all of these radioactive material during uh, his lifetime and to, in order to, um, uh, well, for all the important contributions that he gave to understanding nuclear physics and, and developing also the bomb, the nuclear bomb. So long story short, he got sick and Chandrasekhar went to visit him. Chandrasekhar uh, was uh, Indian, so he believed in, uh, um, uh, so Fermi was sort of mocking him and uh, in a very, they were friends. So I think that that was acceptable even then uh, that, um, Asked Chandra, so when I die, will I come back as an elephant? So it was a subtle hint to reincarnation. And to some extent, uh, they both did, in the sense that uh, the, two, um, the two telescopes, uh, the two satellites that were so crucial in uh, pinpointing the origin of cosmic rays in supernova remnants was, were Chandra in the X-rays and Fermi in the gamma rays. So one might even say that Fermi wasn't wrong, uh, not even when he was joking uh, to some extent. Okay, so um, I think that uh, um, this is probably the end of my time. And uh, I think this is a good point uh, to stop. And I will let you with a, um, a one of simulation of one of my, um, I mean, with the movie of one of my simulations, and you know, simulations always have uh, hidden messages for people who are able to to read between them. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it does not seem we have any questions. Um, so unless any questions come in here in the next minute or two, we'll probably turn it back over to Drew. Thank you very Thank much, you. Uh, Professor. That was um, extremely educational. And uh, if we uh, people think of questions after the fact, too, that as you puzzle things over, you can send them to us via email and we can pass them along. We did, we did have one question come in that said, uh, how directional are the detectors we have for cosmic rays at various energies? Can we tell which part of the sky they originate from? Uh, yes, uh, we, definitely, we definitely can. Um, the, um, the problem is that uh, the flux of cosmic rays is pretty much isotropic. So they come from, uh, the, the, there are no preferential directions uh, on the sky, except for very small uh, deviations from, uh, from a uniform um, uh, distribution of uh, directions of, of arrival. And the reason is that uh, they are scrambled by the uh, galactic and probably the extra galactic magnetic fields as well. So unlike photons, they don't point directly back to the sources. So it's impossible to do astronomy 
with cosmic rays in the same way that you do with the photons. So that's why in order to uh, pinpoint uh, the um, origin of cosmic rays, you need something that, are pro that is produced by cosmic rays, like photons, the photons that I mentioned before, or even neutrinos. So the high energy neutrinos, that, like those detected by uh, Ice Cube, which is a, an experiment at the South Pole that has been able to measure high energy neutrinos uh, uh, starting from 2013, it's invaluable to tell us uh, what are the sources of these uh, 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 high energy particles because neutrinos travel in a straight line as, as photons. Okay, thank you very much. Anything else, Jim? Uh, no, that was the, that's all. Okay, well then I'd just like to thank you all for joining us this evening and hope you enjoyed the presentation as much as I did and that you'll join us again in the future. Also uh, remember once again, that all of our, most of all of our past pro programming uh, in during this streaming era is on our YouTube channel. If you're watching us there now, um, subscribe and, <laughs> and you'll uh, see our new upcoming presentations in your YouTube feed in the future. And uh, if you haven't visited there yet, uh, do take a look because there's a lot of good uh, informative programming available free of charge, like everything we do. Otherwise, thank you very much again for joining us tonight. And we hope to see you uh, out under the stars before too much longer, folks. So good night. <laughs>